good as well. So I will take all of our feedback from this um, activity today, and I'll be presenting um, the certificate afterwards um, from there. Um, we will start promptly at 11 o'clock, so it is 10.59 in 10 seconds, so in 50 seconds. Um, ah. Thank you guys for being That's here. So fine. Um, okay. I really look forward to seeing um, Sarah's presentation. It's a great opportunity for our seniors, as many of you know, to really have an idea and, oh, and Brooks here, um, and to explore something with greater understanding independently, with some deeper knowledge, go on a discovery process, and have some fun and some new learning as a result. Um, I think this really showcases a culminating experience for our senior year, and if you are an underclassman in this audience, which I know many of you are, um, this is a great um, representation of putting yourself out there, trying something new, doing something out of the ordinary, and learning something about yourself in the process. So I hope by coming to these presentations, you start to get the ideas going of what you might do as your final mark on your high school experience. Because this is, you know, they say sociology or psychologically speaking that you remember your first two weeks of an experience and your last two weeks. This is something that you're going to remember, and it's going to kind of close that chapter of your high school career. And so it'd be really great to do something that you're passionate and fun and excited about. Um, and so without further ado, I present Sarah Todd today giving her senior exhibition. And I look forward to feedback and questions. Oh, hi. <laughs> all right. <laughs> We're all here. <laughs> and I will be doing a timer for you, Sarah. I will let you know okay. when you reach 15 minutes. Alrighty, might be a little over that, but we'll see, we'll see how it goes. Okay, so good morning everyone, and my name is Sarah Todd, and welcome to my senior exhibition. Alrighty, so like many of my peers, I began my process with finding an essential question. I've always been the kind of person to think ahead, compulsively, in fact, so naturally I began thinking about my essential question beginning in sophomore year. Um, so most of my project ideas I found all centered around one common theme and that was around healthcare and how I could get into healthcare. Uh, so it all started off sophomore year as I said before. Um, I'd just gotten into high school, I was still finding my sensibility, I was finding my own person within high school and I found myself very overcome with anxiety a lot and so I was thinking about okay well maybe I could do personal training I could do something around fitness and nutrition and mental health and how focusing on my own mental health and bettering myself can lead to me being a better person in general. But then as my high school career went on, I found my rhythm and I found myself not really needing that as a project anymore. So then I thought about my hospital internship being a possible avenue for my senior ex and that unfortunately fell through and I wasn't able to complete it due to scheduling and so that would have led to a very uneventful presentation and so also in addition to all of this I have had the many opportunities to be a very avid traveler during my high school career and I've really fallen in love with that and so I wanted to find a way to incorporate all of these things my love for travel my love for healthcare, and that all presented itself in a medical mission that was going down to the Dominican Republic so that led me to my final essential question which is how will my trip to the Dominican Republic inform my future career choice as a medical professional. So my mentor was phenomenal and is Dr. Charlie Hendricks. Um, I was able to interview Dr. Hendricks during the trip and he provided me lots of information about his own process and his experience as a general surgeon, which was my goal eventually when I went on this trip was to become a surgeon and to get into all that. Um, so Dr. Hendricks attended medical school at the University of Maryland and he came back to MDI because he wanted to focus more on the people and the practice. Uh, he is a founding board member of the Hancock County Medical Mission and he's been going for a majority of the time. Unfortunately, he was unable to be here because he's in surgery, but um, I'm endlessly grateful to him and the opportunities he provided me. Um, he was able to get me in on a lot of procedures, which really furthered my knowledge of the medical practice in general, and he was an awesome teacher, and I learned a lot from him. So my prior knowledge. Going into this trip, I knew a little bit about the Hancock County Medical Mission and also Medical Ministry International. Medical Ministry International is an umbrella organization that teamed up with the Hancock County Medical Mission this year to go to the Dominican Republic. Both are 
organizations where they take in medical professionals and they send them to less fortunate countries where the citizens might not have the correct health care they need and are provided. So we sent down physical therapists and dentists and surgeons. Sometimes we send, send down obstetrics, stuff like that, to help with child care. Um, so that's, I knew, I knew about the organizations for first, for, bless you. <laughs> um, also, I knew going in that my exposure to surgical procedures may be limited due to laws and stuff. It's not common to have a student in the surgical room, in the operating room. So I knew that that might be limited. But I also, in preparation, watched many bad YouTubes on how to do appendectomies and hernia surgeries because I'm a dork. And um, so I, I was prepared <laughs> in that sense. So I had that prior knowledge of I knew what I was expecting going into if I went into su surgery. And also, I knew that this would be my first time traveling without my parents outside of the country. And that was really scary for me, and it was very outside of my comfort zone. So, you might be wondering how I found myself in the middle of this once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. Um, I was extremely lucky to be awarded with a full scholarship mm -hmm. for the mission. Um, through the Hancock County Medical Mission Scholarship, <laughs> aptly named. I had to go through paperwork, I had to go through an interview process in both English and Spanish. I was required to have up to Spanish 3. Um, Ted Sperling, who interviewed me, is a very intimidating individual. No, I'm just kidding. He's awesome. He's awesome if you know him. Um, but I actually almost didn't apply this year because I applied my junior year and I didn't get in because I was a junior, and that was very discouraging for me at the time, but I'm so glad that I reapplied because I was awarded the scholarship and I was able to go on this amazing opportunity with two of my peers. One of them is here today, Nick Dooley, and also uh, Matt Frost, who is an Ellsworth High School student, a senior in Ellsworth. Um, so as we, our job description there, we're selected students, will act as translators between the patients and the nurses and the doctors. So my Spanish skills were really going to be put to the test, and that's a lot of pressure for me because <laughs> I am such a perfectionist. And I'd only taken up to Spanish 3 and a little bit of Spanish 4 at that time. So that was scary. That was terrifying. But I was so up for the challenge, and I was so ready to get down there and start helping out. So you can see here, these are our dorms. Mine is, I don't think the laser pointer works on the TV, but mine's a really messy one right there. <laughs> <laughs> so this is where we were staying. There was a women's dorm and then there was a men's dorm. This was the men's dorm. Um, they didn't stay in the open space. <laughs> uh, we'd often, after long days, we'd hang our hammocks between these beams. And Ted Sperling would break out his harmonica. And Ralph, one of our anesthetists, would break out his guitar. And we'd all sing and we'd play cards. And it was just a really fun time. And then there was also a swig set. And on picture, there's also a dining hall and a pool. Um, but there was also no running, no hot water, and also tarantulas. So that was, that was something that I had to get used to. We woke up in the middle of the night one time, and there was just one in the bathroom. There was a, that was an eventful day. Anyway, so <laughs> carrying on. So we did eventually get to the hospital. That was the day right here pictured. That was the day we got to the hospital, which was the Sunday after we arrived. Um, as you can see, the, um, the OR is pretty barren. That's because the... People down in the Dominican try to steer away, in this community specifically, they try to steer away from the surgical procedures because they don't have the necessary equipment. So they maybe do one to two procedures a year. And this is all the equipment that we brought. This was after. So we spent three to four hours unloading this huge truck. We, it was a lot of logistics this first day because we had to set up everything. We had to clean everything. We had to sterilize everything. We had to get out our instruments. We had to set up our autoclaves. We brought everything to this hospital. So, um, yeah, that was amazing. That was a really cool thing to start set up and see this OR come to life, to really bring it to life in this very small rural hospital. And then over here, you can see me observing a rather substantial hernia surgery uh, performed by Jimbo, Dr. Jimbo, as we called him, and also Lance, who was a local RN. So I did get into the OR. <laughs> and, um, it was amazing, and I really just fell in love with it. So my first week there... I was in sanitation and sterilization, which meant that since we weren't in America and we didn't have the ample opportunities to have instruments at our beck and call, I was tasked with the um, ability to wash all these instruments and bleach them, scrub them. We'd wrap them up in towels or in plastic wrap, and then we put them in the autoclave, which is pictured right here, which is a high pressure steam chamber. And that, it basically, it's just another precautionary measure just to make sure that everything is super clean for the next um, procedure. 
right here is my sterilization team. This was the other Sarah, Sarah with an H, and um, Marion. And Marion left us to go to the clinic after the first day, so most of the time it was just me and Sarah. But Sarah's also a surgical tech, so that means most of the time I was in there by myself with the bleach and um, just, you know, sterilizing instruments. But it was an easier way for me to get into the OR. That's why Charlie put me there the first week, so I could just run in because the OR was right around the corner. And also, it was a really cool way for me to learn my surgical instruments. So, from top to bottom, these are towel clamps, needle driver, hemostat, suture scissors, iris scissors, forceps, tooth forceps, and a blade holder. This was a lump and bump kit, which was my favorite kit to wrap just because it wasn't bulky. And um, yeah, the lump and bumps were used for minor procedures such as cyst removals, mole, mole removals. I was able to see a couple of those too, but none of them are pictured here. So my second week was when my translating skills were really put to the test because I was thrown into the role of a CNA. So it was after a lovely weekend on the beach and I just, I was thrown into this hospital and all, right away I was speaking Spanish to the people. I was telling them how to put on their gowns. I was telling them how I was taking their vital signs, what was happening. I found myself working a lot with kids, which was um, a lot of fun. And I really found my passion in working with the kiddos um, as pictured here. A lot of them would be nervous most of the time, so I'd let them listen to my heart and my breath sounds, which would usually calm them down a little bit. And then I could also compare their hearts and their breath sounds because children have a higher heart rate than adults. So that was really cool. I got a lot of them really interested in that. I would help them take their medicine to begin with. Um, we used propofol to help as a sedative just to calm them down a little. We didn't want to go down into the general anesthetic, oh my God, the general anesthetic land because that just poses a whole other set of com possible complications. So what we did usually for most procedures is that we give the patients propofol as a sedative to begin, which made them sleepy. They'd be put to sleep and then we'd use local anesthetic around the incision sites. So I was charged with making sure the kids got every drop of that propofol. I also helped them learn how to breathe into their masks, as you can see. So what I do is I, I'd show them on me what was going to happen and then I'd hold it up to their face and they'd breathe and that was really awesome just to hang out with them. Um, yeah. So I really, really got into the CNA role a lot more than I thought I would. Um, also, I'm not a certified CNA, so I don't think it was actually allowed for me to do a lot of this stuff if we were in the United States. But I'm so, so, I'm so grateful for the opportunity because I totally fell in love with it. Um, I was working with a lot of kids, as I said before. Um, I was taking vital signs by myself. I was counting out medications by myself. I was responsible for patients. I was sp responsible for talking to the parents when their kids came out of surgery to explain what was going on with their kids because when most kids come out of surgery, they're very confused and they might not remember their parents. So it's obviously very hard if you're you know, in a, with a team of medical professionals that you don't really know. And then I was also taking out IVs and hanging IVs by the end of it, which was cool. I didn't get to put any in, but I did learn, so watch out. Coming for your arms. <laughs> so yeah, that was my second week there. And then my final day, um, I just want to take this moment to um, warn the more squeamish audience members that they might want to look away. Um, there is a picture coming up, a couple pictures. So I got to be in a procedure. I got to assist in a procedure. It was a subareolar fibroadenoma, which translate to there was a lump in a woman's breast and she wanted it removed. So me and Charlie went in there, we got it. I was able to hold retractors. I was able to cut sutures after he was done sewing her up. Um, she grabbed my hand after the procedure. It was honestly just the most amazing thing. You can see here, you can see the mask that we removed. There it is. Um, it's Charlie and me, we had a great time. Um, I just, nothing could bring me down from that high when I was right there. And um, I rushed outside afterwards. I called my parents straight away and then Charlie found me afterwards and he told me that that was an experience that I wouldn't be able to get in the United States until my third year of medical school, which is like seven years down the road from here. So that was so amazing to be a part of, and I'm so, so grateful for him um, and for providing me with this opportunity. So I really think nothing could bring me higher, <laughs> but then, <laughs> then something did. <laughs> Any of you who know me know that I'm an absolute baby freak. I love them so much. Our last procedure of the entire trip was a C-section that I unfortunately wasn't able to get in on because it was too high risk. But I was there as soon as the baby was born. Um, the Dominican nurses were so kind. They let me hold him. They put him. They let me measure his head and his length, and they helped. They helped me 
dress him because I, I don't know babies are a lot more resilient than you think so i was trying to be very gentle they're like no you just pull on the you pull on the onesie <laughs> so I was, I was like i feel like i'm hurting him no but it was fine um so they plopped him in my arms and i was the third person to ever hold this beautiful baby boy and i it was like everything shifted in my world and i was so set I knew that this is what I want, this is what I want to be doing. I want to bring babies into the world every day. I want to have this moment where I can place this child in the arms of their family like I did with this baby and, you know, watch them go off and see how loved they're going to be. And it was the most absolutely rewarding, most beautiful feeling that I've ever had in my entire life. And I think about this little baby boy every day because he was my first baby and first out of many, hopefully. And I'm forever grateful for him for that. So, a couple of my challenges. Really didn't do well on my note cards here. <laughs> All right. Okay. So, um, so as for challenges, um, I found that um, this was a completely new environment for me. I was charged with being responsible for my own person which was very hard because especially in that first week when I was in that room with all that bleach, it was 80 degree heat and it, 3 p.m. would roll around and I'd realize that I'd have one sip of water and a granola bar. <laughs> and, um, that wasn't good. I, I ended up getting pretty sick one of those first days just because I wasn't taking care of myself. So I learned my lesson really quick, which was a really good thing to learn for college. Mm -hmm. um, also, living up to the expectations that other people had for me was so insane for me because going in, people were expecting me to be able to take vitals on my own. They were expecting me to be able to communicate by myself with these people and with these Dominican natives. And that was, that was for a perfectionist, that was extremely hard for me to live up to. But I feel like I did, and I hope I did. And the Dominican natives were so nice. They were so kind to me. They really helped me with my Spanish. Um, everyone was just so wonderful there. So I feel like even though that was a big challenge for me to overcome, I feel like I did overcome it eventually, which made me a stronger person in the end. Also, subsequently, knowing that my actions made me responsible for others, I talked about this a little bit. Before I was in sanitation by myself sometimes, if I sanitize something wrong, that could lead to infection. In my second week, I was counting on medications. If I counted on medication wrong, that could lead to dependence or infection. Also, if I took vitals wrong, okay. Also, if I took vitals wrong, that could lead to a whole other set of problems. So that was, that was tough. But again, it really just made me be confident in myself and know that what I'm doing is right and really made me very conscious of my mistakes, which is good, again, for college. <laughs> also, getting used to the OR was a challenge for me because watching YouTube and being an actual OR was very, very different situations, <laughs> as you would assume. Um, so first of all, there's a small of the bovi, which is an instrument that people, that surgeons use that um, cauterizes and also um, incises. So the smell of burning flesh, that's kind of graphic, but that's something I had to get used to. I had to do a lot of breathing through my mouth, <laughs> um, especially in the procedure I assisted on. And also um, just getting used to the regulations that were set in the OR, getting used to the sterile fields. It's very different than Grey's Anatomy, you wouldn't expect. Um, also with the um, anesthetic that I mentioned previously, where it was local, where they were just put asleep, the body reacted very primally. So sometimes the body, well, all the time, the body would recognize I was being attacked when it was being incised, especially in the first levels. So like when they were slicing through skin, so the body would react and move. And so I'd sometimes have to hold someone's arm down. And that was really scary at first. But mm -hmm. once I realized um, the anesthetist, is, I can't say that word, but they explained to me <laughs> that um, it was all OK and that they weren't registering the pain. It was just the body reacting. So then that was fine. Uh, another s challenge for me was my Spanish translation at first. It was really rough. <laughs> But as I mentioned, the locals were very kind and they were really there to help me. And even though, you know, their kids were going through surgery, they were very much inclusive with me in their culture, which I really appreciated. And I feel like in that short span of time, my Spanish did really improve. So that was really helpful for me. And also my lack of communication and homesickness was really hard for me to overcome. I'm a people person. I love my family and my friends, and I really found my, my dogs. <laughs> I really found myself missing them at some times, and we'd only get to, I call my mom. I try to with, the, with Rachel Sharp's phone every morning just to see if they'd pick up, and the time difference was weird. And so I, I would go three to four days without speaking to my fam, friend, friends and family, which was 
tough at times, but I had such a wonderful group around me that I really felt very included and very loved. And so sometimes I'd manage to, you know, forget about that and just let myself be in the moment. So what now? Um, this trip was absolutely insane for me. It brought up my love for surgery. It confirmed my love for surgery, but also it brought up my love for nursing, <laughs> which is something I didn't expect ever. And so now I'm faced with the decision of how do I incorporate all these things I love into one. Um, for the past five to six years, I feel like I have been forcing myself into a very particular shape. And that is the shape of, I want to be a surgeon. And I've talked to a lot of people. I've talked to, I've talked to Charlie about his experience as a surgeon. I've talked to a lot of nurses about their experiences as nurses, and it all just sounds so wonderful. Um, and I think I haven't really given myself the opportunity to figure out who I am as an individual. Um, so this trip has really made me sit down and think, and it has made me come to a decision that something that includes all my love for everything would probably be midwifery and not surgery. Um, midwifery, I would still be able to first assist in C-sections, which would give me, me my, um, my surgery kick, but also I'd be delivering babies every day, which is this thing I want to do. Um, so as an NP midwife, I will be able to, a nurse practitioner midwife, I will be able to choose my own hours. It, it will be a much more flexible and giving schedule. I'd be able to get out in the world and do what I love sooner. And to quote The Lancet, um, it's a medical journal um, from a paper called the, T the Power of Midwifery. Midwifery is defined as a skilled and knowledgeable and compassionate care for childbearing women, newborn infants, and families across the continuum through pre-pregnancy, pregnancy, birth, postpartum, and the early weeks of life. And as a midwife, I just feel like that fits me personally, and it fits my compassionate nature, and it fits my want to, it checks off all the boxes, basically. So that's where I'm hoping to end up. So in conclusion, I will be going to the University of Maine in the fall in the Honors College. I will be a nursing major, and from then I hope to get my master's in midwifery. Um, and after that, I plan to take on the world. <laughs> so my sincerest thanks, I want to end with my thanks to my mentor, Charlie Hendricks, for his endless support and opportunities, providing me with all the opportunities I need to get in and observe surgery. Um, I also want to thank the entire Hancock County Medical Mission and MMI staff for being the best and most patient teachers I could have asked for. They were truly phenomenal. I couldn't have asked for any better. I want to give a sh special shout out to Emily Brown and Rachel Sharp. Neither of them could be here today, but they really, really helped in talking me through the entire process. They gave me all the information I could have wanted about being a nurse practitioner. And there, um, I interviewed Emily Brown as well. I'd also like to thank Lynn Gould, who is my senior ex instructor, for keeping me on time, making sure all my individual things were in a line. And I also want to thank my amazing family and friends for always being there for me and for giving me their endless love and support every step of the way. And in conclusion, I'd like to end with a quote, which is by Florence Nightingale and given to me by Emily Brown in our personal interview. So I think one's feelings waste themselves in words. They ought to all be distilled into actions which bring results. And I think that encapsulates the answer to my senior ex. Um, whatever I end up doing, I want to be helping others, and I can't, I absolutely can't wait to just get out there and start. Well, this is a hard act to follow, so <laughs> um, I'm going to uh, ask the panelists, um, do you guys have any questions that you would like to ask Sarah, and then we'll go from there to our audience if they would like to ask any questions. Could you say more about why it's important to sterilize instruments? It's so important to sterilize instruments. It was mostly because in America, well, in America, you have like new instruments shipped in every day, and you don't have to worry about reusing. Actually, in MDR Hospital, I think they do go through a similar process, but it's a much more advanced autoclave. But um, when you don't sterilize your instruments, there's a very high risk of infection. And that infection could lead to disease and death and all kinds of nasty stuff that you don't want to get into. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> but, uh, it's, um, yeah, so sterilizing instruments was insanely important. We did soak them in bleach mm -hmm. for a half an hour beforehand. Uh, directly after the procedure, we did scrub them and dry them and made sure that everything was in a line. We were very careful with our sterilizing procedure. Why did you need to scrub them? Just to make sure all the bits were off. <laughs> 
That's that's kind of graphic. That's kind of nasty. But oh yeah. Why is it important to get that stuff off? Because if you have invading bodies into if you have gunk from one person mm -hmm. and it goes into another person yeah. <laughs> that can lead to a whole bunch of just nastiness that you don't want to have to deal with it can it can lead to transfer of disease from one person to another person yeah. it can just crop up with a bunch of nastiness that you don't want to have to deal with so we are very careful with our sterilization procedures and the immune system of the yeah and the, yeah and the immune system can be enti entirely compromised yeah. um it's very dangerous to not sterilize um, correctly. So even though it might not have been the the nursing kick that I got, it was still ex it, it was extremely important, and it was a real it was a lot of pressure for me mm -hmm. as a high school student being in charge of people's lives like that. So most deaths in the hospital uh, are from infection. Yeah. 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 So yeah. I'm really glad we didn't have to run into any of that, and we were very careful with what, how we were sterilizing equipment. What would you say surprised you most about your trip or the hospital? <sighs> the hospital itself probably surprised me most. Um, it is, the level of poverty where we were was astounding and really eye-opening and very humbling. The hospital, the amount of work we had to just put into it just to clean up the OR um, was crazy. And I'd wander the halls, the post the post-op beds, the pre-op beds, um, it was all, everyone was in one room together. It was so different because I had just come out of my hospital internship in America. So having that comparison there of that intense poverty, but like everyone, another surprise for me was everyone was so happy and it, w it really brought to light the materialism that America has and all that stuff. And even though our hospitals may be more comfortable, um, everyone there had so much family and so much love that was that was crazy for me. That was really awesome to see and experience. Yeah. So that was probably the most surprising part. Are we taking questions oh, from oh. the audience? Okay. We'll do us first, and then that okay. Was, uh, because we all have so many great questions. That's the question. <laughs> yeah. Um, so this is so great. I'm kind of like, you did this. This is awesome. <laughs> I don't didn't even know this existed. Um, you. I know you had that love for midwifery, et cetera. Um, mm -hmm. How did you think of mid midwifery as your path, as opposed to just general? obstetrics or like just labor delivery nurse as opposed to going that more holistic approach and did your trip to Dominican Republic potentially impact that and I'm just curious about that kind yeah. of that journey. That you Absolutely. Um, actually one of my sources that I was going to mention but forgot to but I'll mention it now. <laughs> one, of my, <laughs> one of my sources that um, I was uh, going to mention was I've been reading a book since sophomore year by Linda Robinson who actually assisted at my own birth uh, called Sunday Morning Shimwana and it's about her travels to Africa as a midwife and all that and that's really been very influential for me in my decision for midwifery. Um, I feel like as a midwife specifically why I want to go into midwifery but I'm also on a side note I have also learned from this trip that I can't box myself into one shape so I'm staying still very open-minded to labor and delivery stuff like that women's health nurse practitioner but um, I think specifically midwifery because it focuses a lot more on care of baby and mom versus just mom or just baby it's much more of a holistic process as you said before so yeah that's, I think that's why I chose it. Does that, that get is it? That's wonderful. Okay. Yeah, it's wonderful. Yeah. Um, any more from the panelists? And then any questions? Okay. I'm going to open it up to the audience. Um, so, uh, so did this experience, um, when you're thinking about um, you know, nursing or something, have you ever thought about like doctors and quarters or doing something like this again? Yeah, absolutely. That is actually something that I've I found a passion for it. Mm -hmm and I want to go on as many missions as possible. I really have Dr. Hendricks to thank for that, for being such a great role model. He's been on so many missions. I can't wait. I'm going to take more Spanish in college, I think. I really want to get back there, and I think about it a lot, actually. I think about, even though it was such a hard experience for me to go through with everything that was going on, and I just really think it was so rewarding, and I want to be able to provide that health care to, because everyone deserves fair health care. I really want to be able to provide that for everyone possible. And I think that would be really rewarding to go back eventually. Yeah. <laughs> Anyone else? Anyone else? I mean, did you have one? Gotcha. <laughs> well, um, no further ado, let's all congratulate Sarah. Thank you.